Aloha no, I'm Leslie Wilcox, welcoming you to another episode of Long Story Short. This one is a little different. Usually I'm getting to know the guest at the same time you are, but this time our guest is someone I happen to have grown up with. Used to hang out at her home with her family, saw her go through school, boyfriends, marriage, major career moves. So I already know her, and I also know she's full of surprises. Ann Namba is the creator of a fashion line blending vintage Japanese fabrics and contemporary fashion, kimono couture. Her brand, Ann Namba Designs, is being picked up nationally by Nordstrom's and is featured in other select mainland stores. Ann graduated from Kalani High School and went on to the prestigious Fashion Institute of Technology in New York City. After stints in the garment industry in New York and LA, Anne started her own business. When I met you, you were in third grade, I was in fifth, <laughs> and you showed up at Aina Haina Elementary School with your sister <laughs> wearing, and you were so exotic because you were carrying a your books in a bag and the strap was on your forehead. <laughs> it was a woven tribal bag and uh, everyone took about five second looks if you can do such uh, a thing. Yeah, okay, exotic would not be the correct term. <laughs> I was like, nerd, <laughs> I was like, weirdo. Um, that's because we had just come back from living in Thailand and those were like our little um, book bags and they're actually these, these um, ethnic bags from Thailand and my mother's like, these are perfect to carry your books in. So. That's how you carried them, was on your head, so you didn't get shoulder, you know, aches or anything. <laughs> so we did that, oh my God. <laughs> I can't remember the year, but we were young, and you and I took sewing classes together, your first That's formal right. sewing class. That's right, yeah, that was, I think it was, yeah, it was soon after. I know, I wanted to um, learn how to sew, and so um, Nodi came too. Your sister. My sister Nodi, and you were there. And Tammy Higo was there. <laughs> and yeah, you guys were terrible. I remember that. <laughs> I, like, I don't remember that part. Not at no, all. No, you were terrible. <laughs> well, you were about 12. And is that, did, you, did you discover that uh, you were so much the, better than the rest of us? Well, I that, just loved it. I loved it, and it came natural, you know, very natural. Did you know to before me? that that you'd be good at it? Um, well, I think um, my mom will be horrified by the story, but um, it's true. Because I was the second daughter, I got all of my older sister's hand-me-downs <laughs> and I never had my own clothes so the only way to get my own clothes was to actually make them which is why I wanted to um, uh, learn how to sew and so I remember my grandmother died my Japanese grandmother died and she had one of those really old-fashioned sewing machines that you pump the pedal mm -hmm. and it would go and so I just started fooling around I found some fabric and I made this little outfit not knowing what I was doing and my mother saw that and she's like, oh, maybe you need to take sewing lessons. I'm like, oh, yeah, I'd love it. So that's when I started um, doing it. And Nodi started wearing all of my clothes. Everyone thought that they were her clothes and I was still wearing her hand-me-downs. <laughs> so then I started renting them to her, which was my whole entrepreneurial <laughs> start. When so. did you, how much did you charge her? I can't remember, <laughs> but it was in high school because I'm going, that's not fair. I buy the fabric, I make the outfit, and then you wear it like it's your clothes, and everyone just assumes that I'm wearing your old clothes. Well, I remember <laughs> at a certain point in that class, I was trying to follow the lines of my simplicity <laughs> pattern, and I looked over at you, and you weren't even using a pattern. You were just free-forming it. Yeah, I remember you would pin everything, like, every inch apart. <laughs> I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> and you'd just be done. <laughs> like, what's she still working on? And, and you would design your own clothes at that point. Yeah, I started off by just like altering a pattern or, or, you know, and then I used to go to India Imports and buy the um, bedspreads there, and, you know, because that was the hippie days, and make, um, you know, our long sort of moo moo things. <laughs> <laughs> and then people started asking me to sew it for them, so that's when I started doing that and um, charging money, so I started way back when. <laughs> Was that natural for you, the idea of the, you know, the creative part and the commerce part? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm not doing this for free. <laughs> <laughs> but, but tough, right? Because so many people asked you to do favors and, Anne, could you help me with this? Yeah, I still to this day have a hard time saying no. <laughs> Your family was very supportive of you in this business. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, they always, you know, when I announced that I wanted to be a fashion designer. It was like, uh. <laughs> but 
they supported me all the way and you know when I think back now uh, my parents you know they had to scrape together money to send me away to New York to go to school and you know back then you just think well that's what I want to do of course they're gonna pay for it and because your your father was a professor he believed in higher right. ed right. would he have liked you to have been a scientist like he is oh they knew that that was never a possibility <laughs> In fact, they saved some of my old report cards, and um, yeah, my my kids were shocked. They're like, "Mom, you got D's?" <laughs> I was like, "But look at art; it's A's." <laughs> Pick the right job. Yeah, right. <laughs> so you went away to New York, and uh, um, hmm. what was that like for you? What I remember um, when I first landed in New York, and nowadays, you know, parents take kids on college tours and they set them up. I just got there and. Um, got out of the train station with all my suitcases and some ma man comes up and said, do you need a cab? And I'm like, yeah. And he picked up my bags and just took off through um, Madison Square Gardens and I'm following him, he takes me to the curb and he hails a cab for me. And I was like, oh, I thought he was a cab driver. And then he asked me for a tip and I was just like, oh, what? And then the cab driver starts yelling at him for doing that because he was scamming me. So the cab driver and this guy then start fist fighting on the street, and then I'm just watching in horror, and then he yells at me, he says, get in the cab. So I get in the cab, and I'm just like, like I just want to go to FIT, you know, just to school. I was just, I was in shock. I, I was like, oh my God, this is New York. And then I, I got there and decided I was going to go. There was a bagel shop, I wanted to get a sandwich. And everyone's in there shouting out their orders, and I'm politely standing, waiting and waiting, and finally the bagel guy looks at me, and he goes, you gonna order or what? And I was like, oh, I'm sorry. You know, it's just, so that was my very first hour in New York City. <laughs> you realize I better ratchet up like, my oh, uh, confidence level <laughs> yeah, here. Right. Well, by the time I visited you, and this was in the 80s, you were working in the fashion industry, R Radio City Music yeah, Hall, right? Yeah, You're yeah. costuming right, the dancers. That's right, that's right. I yeah. remember thinking, what's happened to Anne? Because <laughs> you walked oh, I know. about five times faster than you ever had, and and. And we were just walking. We weren't going to any particular know, place. Are they? We talked faster, <laughs> and you were very um, uh, proactive in dealing with people. You know, just combative, as a, as a matter of fact, as I recall. Yeah, back oh, back then. Well, especially in fashion um, and in school too. It's really a super competitive field. So you have to, um, yeah, you you can't be intimidated. You got to just get out there and, and and. Did that come naturally for you? No, I was shy, remember? I was really shy as a kid. So, um, yeah, I don't know what happened along the way. <laughs> but was it hard, or did, did you just remember thinking, this is what I am gonna, what I have to do, therefore it's what I'll do? No, um, it was hard. I remember feeling like a country bumpkin when I first got up there, and not being sophisticated, not knowing anything, not being fashionable, uh, not being able to buy the latest, um, you know, fashion. And um, Did you think you were going to cut it? Did you, did, you, did you think you might not make it? I never thought that I wasn't going to be a fashion designer. I always thought that's, you know, I'm going to work in fashion. Um, but, um, you know, I, nev I never thought I would be where I am today. I didn't have that in my fantasies. <laughs> well, what did you think you would do with your degree once you got out of this prestigious fashion school? Um, I thought I would just be um, probably designing for, um, you know, companies in New York City and that someday I might be able to you know design for you know one of the big you know Calvin Klein or something like that mm -hmm. and to me that would have been like wow um, but then you know of course I burnt out of the city and and left so what did you think when you were leaving the city did you think <laughs> oh, you're glad to go I was like, oh. and what next well, I moved to LA because I thought there's a good fashion center there so I moved to LA and then um, at that point, I still did not want my own company. So I moved there and I wanted to um, get into costuming uh, again. And, um, but it, it's, it's so tough. That, that um, industry is really, really a hard industry to get into. And I fell back into the garment district, into the um, actually producing overseas. So that started a whole other interest in overseas and, and producing over there. And then um, naively thought, you know, oh, my bosses are a bunch of jokers. They don't know what they're doing. You know, I just 
thought, I'm doing all the work here. I might as well open my own business. And, you know, very naively, because running a business and designing stuff is completely, it's, it's a lot more than just designing pretty clothes. And so I moved back to Honolulu because I thought, well, at least if um, it doesn't work out, I have a roof over my head and I know that my family will feed me. So I moved back to Hawaii and um, worked here for about a year just to sort of uh, get the climate, figure out resources and, and how it all works here, which is a lot slower. <laughs> yeah, I noticed you started walking more slowly yeah. again <laughs> and talking like, more slowly. <laughs> and, um, and then I started my business and it's been it's been great and you did literally start your business under your parents roof yep. I got the old bedroom and um, I, I updated the my grandmother's sewing machine though so. <laughs> and just I was a one-man show I did everything myself and launched a boutique in 1989 and Ann Namba Designs was born Despite being what she terms a one-man show during those early days of the business, Anne credits family members for their unwavering support. More on that as our conversation continues. Get interactive with Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox. Log on to pbshawaii.org and connect to Long Story Short to see who's scheduled to appear in upcoming episodes. Submit questions for them and submit suggestions for future guests. Get involved and get interactive with pbshawaii.org. Must be a thrill to hear when somebody is wearing an Ann Namba. The first time I heard my name used in, in that, that way, like, oh, I wore my Ann Namba, and I'm like, wait, that's me. What do you mean you <laughs> wore my Ann Namba? You know? And now I, you know, I'll just say, oh, I'm going to wear an Ann Namba. <laughs> so uh, so I'm, I'm very used to it now. <laughs> I remember your dad liked to help you pick the models. That is my dad's main objective <laughs> in all my shows. And your mom is very long-suffering and kind of rolls her eyes and smiles. <laughs> no, all the models know that um, if my dad doesn't like them, they don't get hired again, so they all make sure to say, hello, Dr. Namba, <laughs> whenever, they do, whenever he comes to my shows. <laughs> you had to find a niche for yourself when yeah. you got back home. Yeah. How, did, uh, how did Eurasian clothes uh, in, uh, get to you? How did that idea get planted? Um, well, I think a lot of it had to do with the um, influence of always traveling, seeing different cultures, seeing different fabrics, which um, I love Japanese fabric, love the kimono, the culture, the food, everything. And so um, I was very um, taken with the fabric and the kimono, but you can't really wear a kimono because either you look like you're wearing a costume or a bathrobe. And so I decided, since I had the background of fashion and how to do, you know, Western contemporary style clothing and flattering lines that I would incorporate um, the two. And, and it, it's nothing new. People have been doing it before, but, you know, I have a different, um, different sort of a take on it than, you know, everyone has their own sort of individual take. You know, and then slowly got into doing my own prints because I'm running out of kimonos. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to ask you, where did you get all the kimono that you used? And how, how is that taken in Japan? Are they wild about use, cutting up kimonos? Uh, actually, they're starting to do it now. Oh. You see a lot more of it. Were they happening. doing that at the time you started? No, no, not at all. In fact, they, they would be just like, why are you using that old stuff? It, and, and they would not um, themselves buy it because it's almost looked upon back then as um, you couldn't afford new clothes, so you had to remake one of your old kimonos. Um, nowadays, though, it's, again, you see a lot of the younger generation. I was shopping uh, some of the stores the last time I was there, and you're seeing uh, Japanese labels, jeans with kimono pockets and patches on it. So things are changing. I have a lot of Chinese influence, too. Some of my prints are Chinese-inspired, as well as styles. Um, I did one whole collection once for a showing that I did that was all based on um, Chinese uh, different uh, dynasties and I um, researched it and did that whole thing. That must be fun, the research, his oh, historical yeah, research. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. Now you said you're getting into prints too. I've been doing prints for a long time actually. If you have your own fabric then you can mass produce the styles. So I started doing that, oh gosh, quite a while ago and um, and right now, that's my main wholesale collection. 
Who designs your fabrics? My nephew. He started that snowy son. And um, he started when he was like 15. He's a really talented artist. And, and so I started having him do some artwork for me. And nowadays it's all done on the computer. So, you know, we'll, we'll discuss ideas and I'll look at things. And, you know, if I don't like a color, you know, he presses a button. It's, how's that? <laughs> so it's, it's much different today. So. And he designed the fabric you're wearing yes. now? Yes. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yep. What are women most concerned about when they dress in general? Well, my mission statement is to make every woman look um, taller, thinner, and I just added younger <laughs> now that I can. <laughs> relate. <laughs> <laughs> How do you do that though? Just the cut of the... The cut, yeah. You know, you don't want dowdy cuts. You know, you try to keep it modern but wearable for people that don't have the most, you know, the perfect body. And, um, and it's funny that, you know, if you have a certain flattering style on people and you know how to achieve it, then when they put on the garment, they're like, I love it. And they don't know particularly why, but they, they love the cut. It must be frustrating because sometimes you probably want to a design for fashion model types who can wear anything and you, you have to you have to be realistic and, and design for people who are regular folks. Um, actually um, for me I mostly because I'm not built like a model I always design with myself in mind like what would I want to wear and um, naturally you know I want to look taller slimmer younger so I'll do that. And when the models put it on, I just see that as like, you know, icing on the cake. It's just like, oh, well, they're just so tall and thin. So I don't design for model figures at all, and I never have. And it's just when they throw it on and it's that much better, then, um, you know, that's great. But, you know, I'll have women that say, well, of course it looks good on her. She's six feet tall and size, you know, zero. But I'm like, no, it's not true. Um, if you put it on, it's actually too big on her, but, you know, that's her job to make it look better and put it on because it, it'll, it'll look good on you too. And I was just approached by another store for, to do plus sizes, so now I might expand into that. <laughs> Literally. Not personally. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so is there a new area of the business you're going to be moving into or are you going to be at this level for a while? How, how's it working? Well, at this point for me to expand, um, in my wholesale division, that's the easiest because I contract everything out. So the hard part is designing the fabric, designing the collection, and then getting it produced. Once I do that, I can up my numbers. So instead, of, I, I could say cut 50 of these or cut 500. It's mm -hmm. just adding more numbers. That could be an exponential move then. Yeah, yeah. And it wouldn't be that much more work for us to do. It's just upping the numbers when we order things. So um, we're, we're looking at that. Um, another division of mine that is just going gangbusters is my bridal division. And that started out as, you know, client coming in, oh, my daughter's getting married, wouldn't you make a dress? And well, 500 people came to her wedding and they all, you know, it was great advertising. So now we're doing gangbusters with our um, bridal. What do women look for in bridal dresses when they come to you? What do they want? Um, they want the Asian, you know, influence look. A lot of the girls want to, um, um, have that uh, different fabric, something, um, you know, some of them, you know, it reflects their heritage. Um, just something, you know, a lot of times they want something simple, but really different. And so when they come to us, then, you know, that's what they get. And we, we custom make all of our gowns for our brides. So I understand you're going to be appearing across the nation in uh in a particular store. Something new is happening? Yes, yes. Um, I am, um, well, I'm participating um, in the new Nordstrom store. So we're, we're just going gangbusters, um, getting all the collections ready for them. And, uh, and of course, that goes nationwide. So that's, that's big. That's huge. <laughs> How much do you think that'll add to your business in percentage? Um, gosh, you know, I'm um, like, I said I got a D in math, so <laughs> I don't know. That's why I have my husband who manages the business. Another family member yes, helping in yes, the business. Yes, and, yes, we have. And being a resource. Yes, so we do. Um, and I'm using my daughter as a model now, so uh, yeah, so we have lots of nepotism. <laughs> <laughs> and it works for you. Yes. <laughs> what do your kids take away from your running a business and being a fashion designer, do you think? Well, I hope that they don't 
um, think that life is all about stress. That's really what I hope they, you know, they don't do because, um, you know, I worry that a lot of times I'm like, mom's had a bad day, I'm really stressed. And I don't want them to think that that's what um, running a business is about. So I, I, tr I try to watch that, but a lot of times I know I'm, how's your day, mom? I was like, ugh. <laughs> um, I think I, well, I constantly, constantly remind them that it is a business, so it can go up and down. And um, in fact, I've tried to get, my daughter has done a little bit of her own um, business. Um, and this is just, you know, um, I'm trying to get her to have an entrepreneurial spirit and to realize that if you work hard and, you know, you're, you, you try to use your head about things and, you know, if you have a little bit of talent and you just figure out how to take advantage of it, you know, that you can make money. And so she's been making money off of little things too. And so I think she's going to be able, and she wants to go into fashion and into business. So I think she's gotten that from the business and she really enjoys that part of it. She's a great salesperson too. So Were there times where um, you wanted to rethink the whole business or when it was really difficult to decide where to go next with it? No, actually, um, um, once I started, I never thought, I mean, before I started, I thought, well, you know, no guts, no glory, right? And I can always get a job, so why not? And started doing it, and I never once said, I want to give up, or um, this isn't working, or I'd rather work for somebody, never, ever. But then I've, I've just been really lucky and things have been going really well for me, so. And you've seen other fashion businesses uh, lose their way. Yeah, yeah, come and go. But, you know, I've been able to sort of um, market my um, my look, the image, and, you know, create a good image and, and just keep on top of things, although my body's starting to <laughs> <laughs> revolt. <laughs> Speaking of that, you've, you've done triathlons. I know, that was like my, um, my daughter calls it my midlife crisis. So <laughs> she just said, all of a sudden mom decided to do um, triathlons. So <laughs> was it all of a sudden? I mean, were you ready? Yeah. yeah, no, I just thought, oh, I can do that. That sounds like fun. And so I did it. <laughs> and um, of course now I have arthritis in my knees and tendonitis <laughs> in my arms. And, <laughs> and now you've, uh, you don't do those three events anymore. No, I, I, I yeah, I, I had to give up running. So then I started swimming and biking and then now I can't swim anymore. So um, today I'm gonna try and do a spinning class. <laughs> And I walk in the mornings, and I used to make fun of people that walked for their exercise, and now that's what I'm doing. <laughs> Several times now, I think, you've paddled to uh, Kalalau along the Napali coastline of Kauai, which is rough. There are no lifeguards around <laughs> to save you if you get into trouble. It's about right. a 27-mile paddle from uh, the beginning to the end. Uh, um, well, that we've done that now every year for, oh my goodness, maybe five, six years. And it's my spiritual renewal and it's where um, we go and we sleep on the beach and we have to pump our own water and we look <laughs> <laughs> and you know bathe in the waterfall but we hike every day and um, for me that is just getting back to nature and realizing that in this world you are very small and then all of a sudden it just doesn't really matter that the color was slightly, you know, too yellow. <laughs> or, you know, <laughs> <just like. laughs> and the main fashion garment is the pareu, right? Because you can yes. wear it, you can you towel sleep off on, on it, it, you can, yeah, you can do everything with it. <laughs> and so um, the wilderness trips, the camping, that doesn't jibe with your image as this fashion designer <laughs> who's just perfect at your shows. I know. Um, I remember when one year we came back from Kalalau, and this is after being a week on the beach, right? And we came and direct from the beach to the airport. And as I was checking in, the guy looks at my ID and he starts laughing. He goes, hey, you have the same name as a fashion designer. <laughs> like, oh, yeah. <laughs> I think she's very attractive. <laughs> and another time I was up at a waterfall. And um, I don't know how it got out, um, out but this, this guy there that works for advertising found out that I was there. And he goes, oh, Ann, I always wanted to meet you. And, so I was a little embarrassed of the way I look. So I thought, I'm just going to be cool. Like, I'm cool. You know, I'm in nature. And so what if I look like this? So I was like, oh, yeah. And I was doing my whole, you know, 
I'm I'm nature too and all that and then all of a sudden um, I'm talking to him and one of the um, lenses from my sunglasses popped out and fell on the ground and then I completely lost it and I'm like don't tell anyone you saw me here. <laughs> Do you think your position number two in a family of four kids you know they always talk about birth uh, birth number mm -hmm. being being important somehow? Yes I think I was ignored as a middle child. <laughs> because well, we first, know about the hand-me-down. <laughs> yes see and you know, my older sister, she got all the new stuff and she got to do things first. And then my younger brother was the baby, so he got baby. And the middle child always gets ignored. <laughs> but it seems to have worked out for you. Yeah, I just like to use it. <laughs> <laughs> the middle child has done very well for herself. I've overheard women saying with pride, I'm wearing an Ann Namba. Anne's clientele has grown to include Elizabeth Taylor, Aretha Franklin, Hillary Clinton, Olympic gold medalist Christy Yamaguchi, and many women throughout Hawaii. It was fun sharing stories with a successful Hawaii entrepreneur, creative force, and good friend, Anne Namba. But as always, we have to keep this long story short. Mahalo for joining me. I'm Leslie Wilcox with PBS Hawaii. Ahui ho kako. We lived in Thailand and Iran and then um, just, you lived in Iran when yes, you were a kid. What was that right. like? Um, you know, it was really fun back then because it was the Shah and, you know, we rode horses and we went to a private little school and um, it was it was great fun, um, international school. And um, it was great back then. Your dad was a professor right, right. from the university uh, on sabbatical. Right. And, um, you know, he just, um, he was basically, you know, looking for different experiences to do and, and went as a family. and so. We all sort of got the travel bug and just curiosity in other cultures. I think it was just sort of, um, you know, you grow up around it.